Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning, to be a part of your Sunday morning worship experience. I'm glad to be coming to you. However, I'm coming to you from my office rather than my church. I'm still glad to be coming to you. We're hoping someday pretty soon we're going to be able to, to get back in our sanctuary and kind of start up again. But until then, we'll continue to record like this. Uh, right now, the uh, the uh, pandemic is still very much alive and well in our communities. Uh, many of us are becoming more and more aware of friends and family that are uh, that are coming in contact with it and in some cases are infected with it. So we're not at a time yet where we feel as though that we can be completely safe. It is my hope and our prayer that we will get to that safe place in a in sooner rather than later, be able to worship, be back in our sanctuaries, sing our songs, see each other, rejoice, and be glad uh, to be in the house of the Lord. But until then, we'll continue to do it this way. And we pray, we hope that, that even as we are doing it this way, that, that this is a ministry to you and for you, that you, you find some words of comfort or some hope or some encouragement in the things that you hear as we, as we reach out to you through each Sunday's sermon. We want to thank Jack and Denise Ivy for, for helping us, uh, WRMG for, for taking care of the videos and getting those things online and on TV. And we've been blessed uh, to be able to do this. And it's, it's meant a lot to our church and to the people of our churches and uh, as we continue to be able to communicate. Maybe we pray it just won't have to go on a whole lot longer. I want to encourage you as you listen to us and as you come and join us to continue to remember the people in your the people in our community and around us uh, who've lost loved ones recently, those who are in a struggle for their lives, and those who are sick or quarantined as a result of someone being sick. Um, the numbers are growing and they continue to grow. And for each one of those numbers, there's a there's a bit of hardship or sorrow associated with them. So please. Uh, Remember them and keep them in your prayers. Also, school started this past Thursday. Uh, children were on campuses and uh, were pretty tight. We have to be kind of tight to get on buses and to be in classrooms and things. So it's a, it's a little bit iffy. And we, we need you to pray that God will protect our students, our teachers, and our faculty uh, and our, all of the help at the school. There are so many people who go into helping our children have an education. We want to keep them safe. So if you would, at this time, would you please join with me in, in a word of prayer? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and all the blessings of this day. We thank you, Lord, as we come to you. We come to you as your children. And as your children, we know your hand is upon our lives, each of us being protected and held by you. Father, we lift up to you all those who are sick and struggling Lord, give them the strength they need. Help them to recover. Help them that they might recover and rejoin us, that we might give you the praise and the glory for it. And though it may seem difficult and hard, we, we thank you, Father, for those who've gone on to be with you through this time. Each day there's someone we know or someone we know of that's, that's lost to COVID, but, but not to you. And we, are, we just want to thank you for receiving them and taking care of them eternity when someday we'll be with them as well. God, be with us now throughout this worship service, throughout this sermon. Open our hearts that we might hear you, that it might speak to us and touch us. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. This morning I want to read to you from Luke uh, chapter 7 verses 36 through 50. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. But when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, 
Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing to, with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, but she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Edward McManus tells this story. A woman is dying of AIDS. Her priest has been summoned to her side. He attempts to comfort her, but to no avail. I am lost, she said. I have ruined my life and every life around me. Now I know that I am going painfully to hell. There is no hope for me. The priest saw a picture of a beautiful young woman on the dresser beside the sickly lady. Who is this, he asked. The woman brightened, even in the midst of her weakness, and, and she smiled. She is my daughter, she said, the one beautiful thing in all of my life. And would you help her if she were in trouble or made a mistake, he asked. Would you forgive her? Would you still love her? Oh, of course I would, cried the woman. I would do anything for her. Why would you even ask me a, a question like that? Because I want you to know, said the priest, that our God has a picture of you on his dresser, too. That's a beautiful story, I think. I like what it says, and most importantly, I, I enjoy the hope that it offers. But you see, people will always be searching for hope in this world. It has gone on forever. It will continue to go on. People are searching to find somewhere in their lives where they, they can feel the assurance of, of God's unending love, of something that is of comfort or, or peace giving to them. Our God teaches us there is no time. There is no time that he would, he would cease to love us, want us, or forgive us. He's always willing to offer grace to us, no matter where we've been or what we've done. Grace, grace is a wonderful subject to talk about. But for in that word, those of us who are, are able to understand it knows that that the thing that makes God's grace available to us is his love for us, the depth of his love for us. We have all heard of God's grace. We have all felt it. We have all accepted it. And now each of us, all of us who are Christians, cherish it. And we trust in it as, as followers of Christ, as Christians. We understand, don't we, that, that God is indeed continuously gracious and loving. This grace is a wonderful gift from God given to each of us as we need it. And I think there are questions about it in the church today. Well, not, not whether or not God gives grace. We would all agree on that. 
But instead there are questions emerging when it, that, that ask when is it appropriate to claim that God's grace is at work in the life of another human being? To what extent does God's grace extend? Can we manipulate the meaning and the intent of God's grace in such a way as to fashion God into a mold that makes us feel comfortable with our lives regardless of what our lives are like or how we've chosen to live? Do we abuse the, the idea of God's grace toward us? Those are, those are really, really big questions. Today, I, I don't think anyone would argue that we live in a world filled with sin. We see it every day. We are aware of it in, in the lives of others. We are aware of it in our own lives as well. Sin abounds. The violation of God's laws, the scriptural premises, and the truths found in scripture are, in my opinion, running rampant, if you will, in today's culture. We see people have an insatiable appetite for power and for money, lying, cheating, and stealing. They, they almost seem to, to have become a national pastime at times. They often turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to the words of God. So, so we have things like death and we have destruction. We have easily terminated marriages and pregnancies, drug and, and alcohol abuse. Not only have many turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to, uh, to such things, but if you spend a little time looking around, watching a movie here or, or a sitcom there or checking it out on TV, you'll find that there are times when living an unrighteous life is, is not just mentioned, but it is actually lifted up and extolled in front of us. There is a selective morality, not limited to young people at all, but to an entire world. Now that's a truth that is hard to hear and hard to bear. But it remains a truth that, that we cannot escape it. There's an extraordinary amount of sin that exists in our world. Sometimes I, I wonder though, just exactly how much different are we in, in the church when compared to the world? A lot of ideas out there these, these days. The church has folks who, who may be pushing the boundaries of right and wrong, all of it in the, in the name of, of grace, even today. Grace, God's grace is, is, is a bit of a tricky thing to talk about. Though I, I, I believe in it so much, I have concerns about the way even I present it, and, and in some cases, how others present it. But I know grace, and I understand grace, and I love what it means for me. When I was... 13 years old, I became part of the Methodist Church. As a child, I'd grown up in a different tradition, one in, that saw uh, things as more about the discipline. Discipline was the key to keeping yourself in a right relationship um, with God. It may have been the church more than the denomination, but still it was in my church. I, I heard about hell and, and punishment and a God who was sometimes angry and wrathful ready to come after me if I didn't live a more righteous and appropriate life. For me, I, I could not find a, a father in that view of God. But when I joined the Methodist Church, I was close enough to the age to, to begin to be able to, to understand about God in, in a deeper way. I cannot recall hearing the word grace before I was 13 years old, though I am confident that it was mentioned and talked about, but, but after joining the Methodist Church, I, I became more familiar with it and, and what it meant. I knew that I was not a perfect person. I knew that there were issues and problems in my life, but I also knew that my imperfections, though they were grievous to God, did not cause him to stop loving me or cause him to abandon me. I learned about his grace, how he wasn't going to, to ever give up on me, 
Though I, I may have found a time in my life in which I was willing to give up on him, he was never willing to give up on me. I needed that assurance just to be able to face God each day as the sinner I was and as the sinner I, I am. Grace was important to me. But in recent years, I, I've grown concerned about how we relate to his graciousness as followers of Christ. For you see, it seems to me that the grace of God runs a very, very real risk of being used as a tool to say, well, to say anything goes, if, if you will. God's grace can be used to, to justify just any behavior that we want to, to talk about. And so I, I think mentally it's developing, that mentality, excuse me, is, is developing to some extent, and, and it worries me that, that we may be talking about something that is too easily attainable without being responsible for one's own actions. Of course, I'm equally concerned about the flip side as well. Some may in fact see it as a tool to justify what they are doing in their lives while, while others will tell you that you're a bad apple and if you don't change, you can't hope for God's grace. You can't hope for anything beyond this life. Some even say things like, well, you did this, now you're doomed to hell. No chance of redemption for you. A very good friend of mine, a very good friend of mine's child had, had chosen poorly. He had damaged his life. He had damaged the life of his family, even his own children. For some, his sins were, were too grave, too grave, too difficult, too, too much, and that the only thing that he had hope for was, well, he had no hope. The only thing that lay ahead of him was, was hell and the gates of hell. And in fact, there was some people who said as much to his parents about him as well. But he was a young man who had given his life to Christ years before. And he'd lived years with his life devoted to the church and to the church's purpose. For some, I, I suppose there's not enough grace in God to, to welcome someone like that back into to the fold or into the family. So you see, the discussion of God's grace is no easy task. For some, grace gives license to activities and ideas that are very hard to, for us to square with Scripture. For others, one mistake cuts you off from God. That's as wrong-headed too, I'd say. I think, I think we should approach sin and God's grace and His willingness to forgive the the way Christ approaches it. I think we need to follow his example. Let, let us follow his pattern. I think Jesus demonstrated rather well in today's passage how it all works. When it comes to the way God deals with the issues in one's life or our lives, Jesus is the expert in, in this area. Not Paul or Moses or John or Peter, though they were devoted and and hope to minister to the world and speak on behalf of Christ, they were not as well versed in what they were going to, how it should be handled as, as Christ was. The one who will actually see us that day that we face judgment. Yes, I think Jesus demonstrates the way things should be handled rather, rather well, don't you, if you think about today's story? The woman in our story today was a sinner. We are not exactly certain what she's done. The one thing we can be sure of, though, is that she had earned a reputation. Simon knew what she was like as she was there with Jesus, or at least he, he had some idea of her based on what he had heard or seen. But Simon, this woman was an intruder. She was interrupting an important time with Jesus. Simon never mentions her in any other light other than, than she's a sinner. She's well, she's bad. He never says, we prayed for her. We've longed for God to help her see that she needed to cleanse her soul. Not a, a word that indicates he was concerned for her. For Simon, she was, she was touching Christ and 
violating Christ, if you will. She had no business to be there with Christ. So was she doomed forever to be apart from them because of her, her sins? Well, Jesus let us see the answer to that, doesn't he? Not only does she touch him, but she weeps over him. She lets, she lets down her hair before him and, and washes his feet with, with her own hair. Jesus knew what was, what was going on in that woman's heart. He knew she was a sinner. He recognized who she was as well. Now, he did not excuse her sins, nor did he say that her sins were okay. Instead, he told her that he, that he knew she, she had many. He was honest to, uh, enough to say she had lived wrongly. She had lived inappropriately, if you will. But he was also gracious enough to say, woman, you are, you are forgiven. In faith, she came to Christ with what must have been a wretched life. And the Lord gave her a new one. Not to live as she once did, but to live as a child of God. She found God's justifying grace. She didn't earn it. She just received it because as Jesus put it, she loved much. I've often encouraged my churches to minister to all to anyone and they've they've been very faithful to do that but i've never told them that that they should say that anyone's sins are okay i hope what they've heard me say was minister to them no matter who they are no matter what they've done love them no matter what sins they may be involved with love them even if they continue in sin tell them or show them their mistakes if need be Witness to them, touch them, minister and love them. And then let God do his work. Let the Spirit remind them of who they are. Let them feel the, the forgiveness of, of God down in their souls. You can never make that happen. Only God can. You can only be the, the conduit with which they see and experience God. Speaking of and, and offering grace to another it's a part of our work in, in this world. Let us do it the way Christ would do it. Yes, we, we know what it means to feel God's grace. We know, the, uh, we know the assurance that God has given to each of us. So let us pray. Let us pray that all will one day, all of them will one day know how much God loves them. After all, their, their picture, their picture's on his dresser too. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, there are many in our world, all around us, who are lost and wandering. There are many who have chosen poorly there are many who have sinned and fallen short of your glory. They are in our world. They are in our churches too. We thank you for the grace that you show that says to them and to us, you'll always be forgiven if you want it, if you'll ask for it. That's a beautiful message, Lord. That's the message that came from Christ. Let us have the courage ourselves to speak up and say it to the world. The world needs saving. The people of our world need saving. Pour out your spirit upon us. Help us to accomplish that mission and that task in this world for you. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us in being with us this morning. And I want to remind you that whoever you are, wherever you've been, it doesn't matter. 
You're the same in God's eyes as the saint. Saints and sinners are all the same. God reaches into their lives to make both of them whole. One has already accepted it in their heart, the other can. We encourage you once again to, to think about your spiritual journey. To think about how you could celebrate it with, with others. To think about how you could renew it, if you will. Or maybe find it, if you can. I'm sure you can. God can make that happen, but, but maybe you need a church home to do that in. We'd love to have you at, at Old Bethel, Golden, or Tishminger United Methodist Churches. But again, I want to say to you, whether it's our church or another church, we will be thankful and glad for any soul that finds Christ, wherever they may be. We hope and we pray that as you see these sermons and hear these messages, that they speak to your heart. We'd love to see you. We'd love to know if you're listening, with, if this is on YouTube and you can leave a comment, leave a comment, we'd love it. Or on Facebook, whatever the case may be. Just let me say this. The Lord loves you. And if you give us an opportunity, we're going to love you too. Have a blessed and wonderful day. In the name of